When do you imagine the time will be that will be the last man or woman standing? When do you hope to have full evacuation? Uh, our timescales plan on August the 31st uh, for uh, the evacuation of all the people that we would have said was in the hopper, those people that have pa are passing or have passed security checks, those people that are effectively have a ticket to ride uh, uh, and indeed uh, get out the three cohorts that I think I told you about last week, which were entitled personnel, British passport holders, uh, uh, British officials, uh, and indeed then um, obviously all those Afghans. And, and I think to be clear to your listeners, we are only now in Afghanistan and have been for the last two weeks to process those people. We're not in it for, uh, you know, we're not, we're not doing other diplomatic functions. We are simply there to process all those British passport holders and all those people we have an obligation to. And, you know, our men and women of our armed forces are risking their lives in doing that, but that is the right thing to do. They've risked their lives for the last 20 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, at the very least, our obligation has to be as many of these people through the pipeline as possible. But I, I, I think I also said, and it's, and it's a really deep part of regret for me, um, some people won't get back. Some people won't get back. And um, we will have to uh, do our best in third countries to process those people. Why do you feel it so personally, Mr Wallace? Because <laughs> I'm a soldier. Um, because it's sad and the West has done what it's done. And we have to do our very best, Nick, to get people out and stand by our obligations. And 20 years of sacrifice um, is what it is. Lastly, you and I have been speaking for years, and I, I think earlier you were almost choking up, I think, uh, Mr Wallace. Is that partly because, to remind my listeners, you served yourself, you've been a captain in the Scots Guards. Is that why you feel it so personal? <laughs> no, I just think we all care. We all, want, we all care. We're all trying to do our very best. Um, it's quite a high-pressured environment, and I think um, we just have to make sure we do our best. And it, you know, I don't like waking up in the morning and seeing the footage I see on the telly. Uh, I hate you know, I know we all have our own conflicts as soldiers. You know, mine was Northern Ireland. It wasn't like in Afghanistan. We all have our memories and you cannot help but understand the real sense of sadness and anxiousness from our veterans. And we have to stand by that. I wonder if I can start. We've talked about many things down the years, Rachel Rees, but I have to put it to you. The same question that was put to the party leader. Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? Good morning. Uh, good morning, Nick. And it's great to talk to you. Good to have you on. Uh, I just think that this issue has just become so divisive and toxic and it pits people against each other, both groups who face discrimination in society, women and trans women. And I just find this debate incredibly unhelpful and, and, and unproductive, to be totally honest. At this conference, I want to speak about issues that affect people, whatever uh, their gender and, and, and we whatever their sexuality. And we will get to those, I assure sexuality. you. But is it transphobic, yes or no? Look, is it is it transphobic? Look, I just I don't even know how to start answering these questions. I, I well, just don't find them. I just don't find them. The party helpful. leader suggests it is. So, what what do you, as shadow chancellor, say? I think that people should be able to identify with the gender that they feel comfortable Respectfully, with. Respectfully, shadow chancellor, that wasn't my question. My question is: Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? It's, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Why is that? Because if if somebody I, look, I, 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 why are we having to discuss parts of women's anatomy? Because on, one of your on colleagues. Because one of your colleagues feels unable to attend your conference. And she should feel safe attending our conference. But I don't feel comfortable talking about women's anatomies and different parts of women's bodies with you, uh, Nick, or, or frankly with anybody else. But if somebody identifies. As, as a woman and a man, or a man, they should be able to do so, whatever their body parts are. Um, we've been hearing this terrible uh, things this morning about this uh, poor lad, Arthur, and uh, rightfully the, the public are asked to uh, report any concerns that they have. And also, years ago, uh, Jimmy Savile was able to get away with uh, his crimes, even though people had inklings. Okay. Now, I've got uh, issues... Um, regarding a Christmas party that went on 18th of December last year at Downing Street. Um, firstly, are you investigating this? Because there seems to have been a law breach. This is the... Thank you for that, Ian. This is the allegations that's been contained in the Daily Mirror 
that when we were under tier three restrictions, I think it was, Commissioner, last this time last year, there were two parties held within number 10, a rather informal affair in late uh, November and a more formal affair in December. It is believed Boris Johnson attended both. Angela Rayner is writing, or has written, I'm sorry, to Cabinet Secretary Simon Case demanding number 10 be investigated and the police be involved as to whether last year there were at least two breaches of the law. Commissioner. So, Ian, you asked if we are investigating, and the answer to that uh, is no. Uh, and uh, as far as I am aware, we have had no complaint. And therefore, I really can't comment on what did or didn't happen there. What happens if you this letter... Would that, what is normal form? Does the letter now come to you? Were Angela Rayner, to, the Labour politician, were she to write to you suggesting you, or you and your colleagues take a look at it? Would you, if there's a potential abuse? Pe people write to me every day. I always read their letters. Of course I do. Uh, so you I can't say what the, uh, the, 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 there's no such thing as the normal form. If I get a letter, I'll read a letter. Of course so you I would look into this Nick, if you. I can't comment on what no, we but would if do you were afterwards. To be contacted. I can't comment on uh, because I don't know what the letter would say. No, no, but it, the, the suggestion is that two parties. I mean, I'm sure you and your colleagues or your press team are told you, Boris broke. Uh, Boris party broke COVID rules. Police might investigate. Are you going to investigate if you're given the details? Nick, we're in t the world of complete hypotheticals. I have not received a letter. All right, I'll write your letter really, now. I'm suggesting. I really I'm can't putting it comment. To you now. I cannot comment any further. I'm not going to. I know you want to get. I know you want to get a sort of a headline but, out of me that but if we're you, doing if this the, or that or the other. But I don't know until I get the letter. I don't know what. We but they're not. Do. I'll read if it. If it happened, he's not beyond the law. If you sold a party last year, is he? This is the Met. We are professional. We are impartial. We act without fear or favour. We follow evidence. That's what we do. So if Whoever he has held a party, is. you'll have a look at it. I've, I will read the letter. Well, I've got a d different opinion. Morning, Nick. Morning, anyway, yeah. um, what it was, I voted. I voted to leave. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the EU have been absolutely useless on the vaccines. Yes. But I, I do a lot of eBay to uh, Europe. Oh now, yes. Now, no one's buying anything off me in Europe. No. Well, this is right? the reality. It, yes. No. Yeah, but I've been lied to. Did 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 anyone say? Oh. When we leave the EU, all our stuff's going to be taxed yes. when we try to sell it. So why is someone going to buy something off me? I sell, like, records and stuff. Right. Why is someone going to buy a record off me when there's a 25% tax on it when it goes to Europe? And also, if I buy anything in Europe, we have to pay a tax on it right. when it comes into the country. It's outrageous. So I, we I, were so lied so, to. OK. We, so, we, let, can I just ask you, so in the one, one you know, in a balance of scales... You have the vaccine success, but in the other, you have the trade blocks, you have the issues at Dover and Felixstowe, and you have Northern Ireland. So, again, w what is the final deciding vote from you on, the, on those two aspects? I'd, I'd stay. We've been lied to. That was Chris, who said to, also in the call that he effectively watched his mother draining away in front of his eyes because he was trapped a journey that should have taken an hour and a half, took six hours. That was to L LBC's Andrew Pearce. Now, last week, a spokesperson, Liam Norton from Insulate Britain, came on the show, and he's joining me again now. Mr Norton, what do you, and there's every chance that Chris is listening. What would you say to him? Good morning. Hi. Hi, Nick. Um, obviously, our hearts go out to Chris and his mother, um, and it's a tragic situation. And um, it's, it's terrible, Nick, isn't it, that we're... we're we're in this position where we well, have it's not to terrible. I'd like it to be actionable. I'd like it to be actionable. I would like to round your colleagues up and put them in jail. So I don't think it's terrible. I think it's actionable. And I still haven't really heard, apart from a rather lame apology, how can you justify your actions? Well, it isn't about justification, Nick. It's about acknowledging the situation that we're in. And what we're what we're saying to to you, Nick, and and I've and I've and we, I spoke to you last week, and I told you about what we do in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. And you came back at me with a, a story about diesel cars, and it sounds like you can't emotionally connect with the truth. Don't talk to me about to emotionally. About. Don't lecture me about emotional connection, Mr Norton. You've just heard a caller explain how he watched his mother effectively drain away in front of his ass for six hours. Don't lecture me on emotional okay. content, OK? Let's and get I'm that straight. To you, and I'm talking to you about the suffering of millions of people. And I'm talking and you, to you about you the suffering of Chris's on. mother, which yeah. you you brought about with your colleagues. OK? Yeah. Now, yeah. the fact that people are suffering is hideous, but that is on such a global scale. It impinges on the governments of China, India, the United Kingdom, Australia, the everything. That woman effectively dying in front of her son's eyes is down to you and your colleagues. 
I, so I'm when not, are you going to suddenly stop with these lame apologies and actually accept that this is not the way to protest? Mr Norton. It's, it's, it's awful, Nick, isn't it? That we have to, I've had enough. We're in this I've position. had enough. I've had enough. It's not awful. What's awful is climate change, of course. What's awful is that someone has virtually died because of your actions. That's what's awful. When students open their results today, I know that for many there will be the same trepidation and anxiety I felt 27 years ago when I opened that envelope. How did you fare 27 years ago today, as it were? Well, I, I remember walking up to those college doors, Nick, and going into uh, my college at sixth form and getting that envelope, opening up that uh, envelope, seeing the grades on there and just feeling absolute delight. Yes. What were those grades? As, as the sudden realisation, Nick, yeah. that actually all my dreams of that next step of doing social science yes. at Bradford University opened yes. up. And yes. for, a, uh, for a lad growing up in Scarborough, Bradford was the most exotic and oh, exciting place in the whole and what world. what were your grades so, uh, again, Mr Williamson? I, I, I don't think I mentioned my grades. No, yeah, so I wonder if but, you could. Uh, uh, so, no, no, it's, it's absolutely fine. But uh, I, it opened the, what the were pathway your to, to, to those next steps. And I was absolutely delighted. Yeah, uh, you can't and remember that's what your grades. So many, uh, it's so long ago. I mean, it's 27 years ago. Did you get three A I mean, stars? It's, uh, I, I, I didn't get three A stars, it's fair. You get three but what it did what did you do, get? Uh, but what it is fair Why to say... Why won't you tell me? Is it a state it, it, secret? Oh, it, it absolutely is. I, I've forgotten. It's so long ago. I mean, it's 27 years ago. All I mean, right. you probably okay. can't remember what was happening last weekend, <laughs> Nick. We, we've got yeah, to... Yeah, but I've greater um, years um, than you, Mr Williamson. Y y Mr Bamberland, um, good morning. We're going to do this in a slightly different way, if we may. I notice you've been doing other broadcast interviews. In a couple of months' time, I come to the end of my lease agreement with my car, which is a petrol-driven car. I've had just about every car you can imagine in my life, Mr. Billman, from a Ferrari, you won't be surprised, to a Morris via Audis and Porsches and God knows what else. Uh, Honest Ed, the car dealer, why should I buy electric? Good morning. Hello. Um, it's good to be with you. Um, <laughs> and, I'm glad you've and I'm glad you've come to Honest Ed. Uh, you've, made the right, you've made the right decision, Mr. Ferrari. Thank to come you so to, Honest to, Ed, to, why should to, I go electric? To come to Honest Ed. Um, well, you, look, you should... The, the electric vehicle revolution is coming. You're not going to be able to buy a petrol and diesel car from 2030. It's good for the environment. It's good for air, uh, cutting air pollution to go uh, electric. The, the running costs of an electric car are less than the running costs of a petrol and diesel car. But you may be wondering, Mr. Ferrari. Yes, honestly. Well, look, how, how, am I, how am I going to afford to buy an electric car? Because aren't the upfront costs quite big? Yes. And Honest Ed's is offering you... A, a zero interest loan ah. so that actually you get a loan from government uh, to, to cover the upfront cost. And then as you make savings from but, the lower running cost of an electric car, you can uh, uh, you can pay it back. But here's the thing, so, Honest Ed. Is it a deal, Mr Ferrari? Well, well, Honest Ed, you see, when I go down to the pub, if I'm allowed in with this government, don't let's talk politics, and I have to show a indeed, passport to have a... Indeed, oh, I make don't a rule of not talk... That. Oh, at Honest Ed's, we don't talk politics, Oh, Mr. we don't Ferrari. want to talk about that. Will yeah. my friends laugh at me when I arrive in an electric car? Definitely not, Mr. Ferrari. Why would you think that? Well, they've all got Porsches and Audis and Jaguars and things like that. No, no, no. There's lots of different electric cars that you can buy. Um, and Honest Ed's is about making it affordable for you. And coming to the serious point. And also, and also, and also, look, important. Yeah, yeah I was, uh, sorry. It's to jobs. Stop, but, uh, now, I mean, now to Ed Miliband, we need yeah. jobs. And I don't care yeah, whether exactly. Labour, we need Conservative, jobs. Lib Dems. How will this create jobs, Ed Miliband? It, it, exactly. Look, we've got, a, we've got a global race on, Nick. There's a global race on to uh, be the place where the electric cars get made. And we need these factories, these so-called gigafactories, electric battery factories. We're not going fast enough. The the big the Faraday Institution experts say we're going to need seven or eight of these. We, we, we've got one happening, probably. We're saying fund another three, fund them in this parliament. Let's get moving. Government can take a stake in it. There's upside for government because this electric car thing is going to take off. Um, but we got we got to get moving because our car industry is incredibly important, and we could either put on lots of jobs in our car industry, or it could really be a threat to our car industry. Let me hold you to a number. Lastly, Ed Miliband, you put say put on quotes lots of jobs. Do you have an idea how many and what regions are we looking at? So, so the the Faraday Institution says we could put on seventy five thousand extra jobs in our car industry 
uh, as a result of this. We know the places where the car industry is really successful, like the West Midlands, the North East, and so on. But actually, it's all around the country, but it's also about the supply chain, Nick. So th- there's real potential here, but government's got to step up. We've got to get on with it. And as you say, as we come out of coronavirus, we know we face a jobs emergency. This is the right thing to do. You mentioned pen farthing. You might have seen this tweet, Secretary of State, quotes, I've been left to fend for myself in Kabul, cut off from my MOD support line by the special advisor to Ben Wallace, 22-year Marine left behind lines. Neither my staff or animals now get out. Cheers, Boris Johnson. Secretary of State. Well, first of all, that's bollocks, Nick. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, been, I've been watching, uh, listening to that. Uh, Penn was offered uh, and contacted on Friday to be brought forward to fly. His um, uh, wife uh, left, I think, on Friday. Uh, we have said that he will be eligible. He is as a British passport holder, and I strongly advise him to come to the airport and uh, to take advantage of the route out. Uh, his personnel, his 68 people, will be eligible to come out. Uh, but this is not about uh, what, what I've been told about a lot of, which is simply the issue of uh, a plane coming in. This is about the flow at those gates that I've talked to you about. And, you know, uh, uh, my advisors don't stop anyone. They don't make those decisions. Uh, the airport is run by the United States. This is not about a plane you charter coming in. This is about whether when he turns up, and, you know, he was called forward last week. When he turns up, uh, will he get processed in time and on a plane? Uh, will his people get processed on a plane? And, you know, I simply have to prioritise people uh, over animals as well. I have some really desperate people in that queue who are really under threat of life and death. Uh, and if we don't get them out, uh, you know, their future is very, very bleak. I simply have to prioritise those people over pets very important doesn't mean to say we don't care about animals we all are animal loving nation uh, do i think that, that that some of those people will be as under greater threat as some others i think there are people under really acute threat and i have to get them through i read in one newspaper today there could be a trade war concerning northern ireland in the brexit treaty this particularly pertains to a war over northern ireland's ability to keep selling sausages made in Britain, made in, effectively in the United Kingdom itself, Northern Ireland. This speaks very much to your brief as a, a Secretary of State for food. What can you tell us on that? Well, I, I don't think there's any need for any uh, trade war, but the Northern well, Ireland what, protocol... What is the problem about Northern Irish sausages, then? Well, there is, there's no problem. The, the issue, there's no problem with our sausages or indeed our chicken nuggets. The issue is there is a peculiar quirk in EU law uh, which says that sausages that are made in what they term a third country, uh, and that for this purposes that's anywhere in Great Britain, uh, are banned from sale in the European Union. Our view is that um, uh, obviously Northern Ireland is an integral part of the UK, so that's not a, an export trade, and therefore that trade should be allowed to continue. There's a uh, expert committee, specialised committee, that was set up to iron out these sorts of uh, wrinkles in the Northern Ireland Protocol and to deal with some of the uh, you know, idiosyncratic uh, things that you can sometimes get in EU law. And we just need the European Union to engage constructively in that process. So we don't sell sausages into Europe then? The United Kingdom does not sell sausages into, U- into Europe? No, but we do into Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, it, you, you might ask uh, why the European Union has this peculiar ban on the sale of sausages. Okay, I will. Uh, from why does countries? the European Union have this peculiar ban on the sale of British-made sausages, Secretary of State? Uh, well, I've no idea, but I suspect it links to um, some kind of perception that they can't uh, really trust uh, any country other than an EU country to make sausages. Uh, I think that's a nonsense. I think we've got a very good. Uh, sausage industry uh, in this country and uh, we've got the highest standards of uh, food hygiene in the world. You, you mentioned the Prime Minister a couple of years ago talking about those promises. Also a couple mm. of years ago we were told that if we left the European Union we'd be saving £350 million pound a week that go to the NHS. You're far better at sums than I. I've, I've done a couple here. That's tens of billions of pounds we've saved. Where is it? Why do we need this additional funding now we've left the European Union? Because despite all the extra money that's gone into the NHS even before the pandemic and the money that's continued to go in because of the impact of the pandemic, it hasn't Secretary been enough to Secretary meet the of challenges. State, 350 million, and also, of course, noting that you're a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, so you're far better at sums than I, £350 million pound a week since January of last year is tens of billions of pounds. Why isn't that bailing out the NHS? 
Or is it another lie from Boris Johnson, just as the lie in his election manifesto? There is no £350 million a week. There are no promises. You cannot believe a word that comes out of a Conservative's lips. Secretary of State. <laughs> Not at all. Well, so where's we look at, Tell me where I, that 20, maybe £30 billion pounds is. I can't seem to find it. You're both Secretary allow, of State for Health and a former Chancellor. Where is it, Mr Javid? Allow me to Please. answer that question. Mm. As we've left the EU, it happened at the same time as the global pandemic. And that money, and, and much, much more, has gone into the health and care service. So we have seen, in the first year of the pandemic, with the government put in an additional more than £40 billion, pounds, so much more than the figure that you folks on, because of the pandemic. In the first half of this year, just this year alone, we've put in £29 billion pounds more into health and social care. Just, uh, just on Monday this week, I announced an additional £5.4 billion pounds for the second half of this year. And now we're announcing this package for the long term. So the money has gone in. And where has it gone? The answer to your question, so much of it, as, as, as your sure. listeners will know, has gone into dealing with this pandemic. So those vaccines, those 90 million jabs, that's where it's gone. The extra PPE, that's where a lot of it has gone. Goodness the me. testing and tracing service where we're spending £15 billion pounds this year so people can get tested before so, they meet their loved ones. If they don't feel well, uh, they can then make sure that they're isolating and not infecting others. That's where it's gone also. So, you know, we, would, we're, we're not hiding any of this money. It's going into the health and care service. It's being used, a lot of it rightly, to deal with the pandemic right now. But we need to plan for the long term. And that's what yesterday's announcement was about. So we're £407 billion pounds already due to COVID. Thank goodness for Brexit, otherwise there'd be an additional thirty billion pounds then. Secretary of State. I think I, I think we are fortunate as a country that we can actually uh, afford to support our NHS, support our care service. Of course, that support comes from hardworking people through their uh, their taxes. Even when we borrow the money, everything, everyone knows that's not sustainable for the long term. I mentioned that because some people in Parliament were saying, "Why don't you? We understand you need this money for the NHS. Mm. We also want more money in adult social care. But why don't you just go and borrow it? That's not the responsible thing to do. Certainly not for a Conservative government." <laughs> 